Good morning, and welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Gary Lodeholt. This week, we are attempting to make it through the Exodus story and put things a bit in order for us. Today, I need to jump ahead a little bit, past some significant events that you know about. You see, soon after the incident at Massa and Meribah that we talked about yesterday, they make their way to the mountain of God. Now, traditionally, we think of that as Mount Sinai, and if we look at maps, we find Mount Sinai all the way down at the point of the Sinai Peninsula. Absolutely, unequivocally, maybe that's where they were. <laughs> you see, that's a long way from where they were going, and in fact, in exactly the opposite direction. What may be likely is that the mountain at the tip of the peninsula was named Mount Sinai many years later, after the story and not before. There is good evidence that the more likely place where all this happened, where the true Mount Sinai was, was on the eastern side of that peninsula, away from Egypt and closer to the promised land they were headed toward. Some other bits that may support this idea is that the mountain they visited is sometimes also called Mount Horeb. And there are other Bible stories where people visit the mountain of God, and it seems to be in this eastern area and not at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula. No one really knows. Anyway, they came to the mountain of God, and there Moses was given the Ten Commandments. The next several chapters of Exodus recount the story of many laws and ordinances that God set before the people, and there are instructions for how to build the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, and even some ordinations. Finally, at the end of chapter 31, we find these words. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. The thing was, Moses was up on that mountain with God for a long time. And while Moses was up there, the people were left on their own. Aaron was there to be sure, but no one knew what had happened to Moses or even whether he had been killed by being so close to the presence of God or even whether or not he was ever coming back. So they went to Aaron and said, We don't know what has happened to Moses, so make some gods for us to lead us, since we are left bereft. So, surprisingly, Aaron, Moses' brother, told them to bring him all their gold, which he then melted down and made a golden calf for them. The next day they offered burnt offerings to it and had a big celebration. Meanwhile, up on the mountain, God said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people have acted perversely and have turned aside from what I commanded them. Once again, God calls them stiff-necked and said to Moses, Let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. Oh, the shame hidden in those words. Up until this point, God had called them my people. But now he looks at Moses and calls them your people. After all that God had done for them, at the first chance they turned away from God and went chasing after another God, forgetting all about the first commandment about having no other gods. God knew what that meant. They weren't God's people at all. How we wish those words didn't apply to us. How we wish that we didn't abandon God and chase after dozens of other gods in our lives. 
It is often said, that which we value most highly, that is our God. I'm sure you can come up with a comprehensive list just as much as I can of the things we let take primary importance in our lives rather than God. And the biggest challenge of this may be the subtlety required to notice all that we take for granted and don't examine to see how they are gods in our lives. God said, your people. Oh, how we wish those words didn't apply to us. But they do. And yet, oh, the grace hidden in those words. Maybe you didn't notice what God said. Let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. As harsh as that sounds, there are amazing words of grace and hope there. In spite of the fact that the people have continually griped and complained about God, in spite of them turning away from God and making a golden calf to worship, in spite of them breaking the very first and probably the most important commandment, abandoning their faithfulness to God, God said to Moses, let me alone. Let me alone. Don't beseech me on behalf of this people, because if you do, there is a good chance I will change my mind and forgive them. You see, if that chance didn't exist, there would be no need to tell Moses to leave him alone. God would just consume the people. But with those words, let me alone, God offers a little bit of hope. God opens the door to grace. Moses does implore God not to consume the people. Moses doesn't ask on behalf of the people, but rather he reminds God to be true to God's self. The Egyptians and everybody else knows that you brought this people out, he tells God. And if you destroy them now, what will all the other nations say about you? Be true to the God of love and grace and salvation you have proclaimed yourself to be. Then Moses goes down, carrying the tablets of stone, and when he sees what they are doing, he throws the tablets down and breaks them, symbolically demonstrating how they have broken the covenant they had with God. In the end, Moses gathered the people and told them he would go seek atonement from God. That's an interesting word which can be split up to say, at one minute. Moses went back up the mountain to restore the people to being at one with God again. God did forgive, but there were consequences. They were afflicted with a sickness for a while in, in response to making the calf. Let me alone. What a grand statement of grace and hope. It's the grace we receive. It's the hope we share. Thanks for watching, and remember to let this day belong to God.